By last financial year, India's total exports crossed a new landmark of $400 billion. India is close to signing a potential free trade agreement with the UK. The goal is to seal the deal by Diwali. Another trade pact with Australia is in the making. All of this happened during the tenure of UN Union Commerce Secretary BVR Subramaniam, who retires tomorrow. After graduating from the 1987 IAS batch, he was asked with overseeing the bifurcation of Jammu and Kashmir. And since then, he's been helping steer India's trade policy during the pandemic. Joining us now to look back at his tenure and future prospects for India's trade growth is the man himself, uh, the Commerce Secretary BVR Subramaniam. Mr. Subramaniam, many thanks for joining us here on CNBC TV 18. Let me start by asking you about where you believe uh, we are poised at this point in time. The last conversation that you and I had, which was a few months ago, you believed that India was in a sweet spot, given what we are seeing with the rebalancing of global supply chains. Do you believe that a lot of the work that India needed to do, a lot of the policy bulwark that India needed to put, needed to put in place to ensure that we do capitalize on that sweet spot has been done? Uh, thank you, Shireen. Thank you. Thank you for taking time off and calling me over. Yeah, I'll only say one thing. The sweet spot has actually become sweeter. As days pass by, I think India's attractiveness is increasing. And I said last time, all the challenges are domestic and not international. We need to gear up and catch the sweet spot. I mean, as things are unfolding, I mean, the EU is actually rechanging and resetting its relationship both with China as well as with Russia. I mean, they're looking desperately for other partners. And who else is there other than India in terms of size and capacity? It's the same all across the world. So as I said, the sweet spot continues. It's becoming sweeter. And the points which I raised and last time when I was with you, that we are resetting our trade policy stance. We are becoming far more open. We are embracing the globe with confidence. I think that journey is on. There's recognition now, not just in commerce, but all across government, that it's important that we actually reach out and embrace the world in trade and in finance. And I think that's the way forward. And I'm sure the country currently is fully geared to capitalize on this opportunity. You said the sweet spot is getting sweeter and uh, that the world is looking for partners outside of China and India is a beneficiary of this rebalancing. But let me ask you about the global environment per se, Mr. Subramaniam. Uh, since we last spoke, the global environment has deteriorated. There are many more headwinds at this point in time. Uh, of course, there is the Russia-Ukraine war. There is the volatility of currency markets. The rupee not immune to that either. On the export front, as you leave office uh, uh, in the Commerce Ministry, how much more challenging is it likely to be for India to be able to achieve the kind of targets that it set out for itself? Yeah. When we spoke three months ago, the global headwinds were there. And as you rightly said, they've actually become more difficult, they've become stronger. But that doesn't mean our opportunities have gone. Uh, there is something called a trend, and the trend certainly is either flat or downwards globally. I mean, there's a lot of pessimism all around. But individual countries are positioned differently in this overall trend. And I think it is that is what India has to capitalize on. And I think the opportunities are there in the short run, and there are opportunities in the long run. Mm. And I think if you, you need to always distance yourself from the immediate to look at what is there in the long term. So I think in the long term, India is positioning itself well. And as far as the short run is concerned, I am not that terribly pessimistic about what's in store for us on the trade front. I mean, we have an ambitious target this year of $750 billion, which includes both goods and services. Last year, we targeted $400 billion, and we aimed and got $422 billion. And in services, we thought we'll do something like 220 or so, and we did $254 billion. Both put together, our $676 billion was our exports. This year, in spite of the headwinds, in spite of the recession in large parts of the world and increasing interest rates and inflation, we are going to touch $470 billion, which is a good $50 billion more than last year as far as merchandise goods are concerned. And services, they are actually rocking because last year's excellent services performance mm. of $250 billion plus was without travel, tourism and other elements. 
they're all the entire hospitality and contact sectors are coming back so services are averaging 25 billion dollars a month we'll easily touch 300 billion there's no way to believe that we are not going to do 750 billion dollars the most pessimistic scenario pessimistic scenario would be 750 billion dollars it's only going to be higher than that uh, rather than lower but the important message is that having been flat at 300 billion dollars plus minus 10 percent for more than a decade India has broken out of that uh, band. Mm -hmm. We broke out of 300 billion, touch 422. We are now going for 470. If God is willing, kind, we capitalize on more of these agreements. We'll probably touch even half a trillion this year. But as we extend the trend long term, you know, these recessions will be always followed by again a jump and there'll be a boom again. So these boom and bust cycles are part of economy. But if you look at over a five, seven year period, I think we're going to touch a trillion dollars in goods and a trillion dollars in services by 2030. It's certainly going to be that. A trillion dollars in goods and a trillion dollars in uh, services by 2030. You feel confident of uh, India being able to coast that trajectory when it comes to exports. But Mr. Subramaniam, you know, you talked about these trade deals. And what we saw uh, was a pickup, a gathering of pace, finally, after several years of stagnation, as far as inking fresh trade deals is concerned. Uh, the hope is that the UK trade pact will get done by Diwali, uh, that uh, the government in the UK itself is facing its own set of challenges, so we don't know what will come of that. But uh, has this been one of the, the big changes, at least as far as your tenure is concerned, the fact that we finally moved on inking fresh trade deals? And what do you believe the road ahead will look like on this front? Okay. Whether this change in mindset is attributable to me or not is irrelevant. I think the bigger point is I happen to be in position at a time when the rethink started happening. I think the country regained confidence. It took a while to actually study the impact of other agreements that happened in the past. And based on that, I think it's clearly visible that in the last one year, there has been a reset in India's trade policy stance. And that reset is based on confidence, based on Atma Nirbharta, we go ahead and sign trade deals with complementary economies. These are countries, we, we have something called a complementarity index. The trade deals we are negotiating are with countries whose complementarity index is very high. That means our imports match their exports and our exports match their imports. So that is absolutely one of the biggest reasons. And I think these trade deals won't have gone ahead unless there is support absolutely from the top. I think the entire political leadership, the government, the, uh, the, all the departments in government are completely behind this strategy. And it's also very clear, India is going to be an importing country in a large number of goods and services for a long time to come. There are a lot of natural resources we don't have. And the only way you compensate for that is actually going in for greater exports. So I think the trade deals open up markets. Market access is our key goal in all trade deals. The UK one, as everybody knows, is in its final stages. We are close to 80, 90 percent done with that. There was a bit of a setback in terms of the changes that were happening at the other end. You know, there was a change of the prime minister and the government there. There was an unfortunate uh, mm. the death of the queen there. So there were certain delays. But in spite of that, I think at the official level, things have been moving. And I think we should be in the last few laps of that agreement. We are not working to a deadline per se, but I think we are working with efficiency. And efficiency mm. automatically ends up throwing up deadlines. Yeah, last few laps as far as the UK trade policy is concerned. But, you know, Mr. Subramaniam, you spoke about uh, this uh, uh, renewed vigor as far as inking trade deals are concerned and also uh, the, the need for greater market access. One of the concerns that has been raised is that in the quest for Atma Nirbharta, has India begun to look much more insular? It also comes from the fact that successive budgets over the last few budgets have actually seen an increase as far as uh, import duties are concerned. And this business of import substitution, is this really the best way forward? Uh, I, I wanted to understand from you, uh, you know, the, the, the pros and cons, the risks and rewards of the policy pursued on this front and any cost correction you believe that needs to be done. No, my interpretation of Atma Nirbharta is actually self-confidence. And I think any country will end up manufacturing some products and importing some products. A, there are strategic areas where we need to have a large degree of self-sufficiency. It's undeniable. I mean, semiconductors is one. In pharmaceuticals, we realize that our, mm -hmm. when we make a lot of pharmaceuticals, a lot of the raw material for that, the APIs, are all imported. 
Now, these are strategic issues where I think there is a need to have domestic manufacturing capacity, and that's why there is government policy there supporting this kind of manufacturing capacity being created. You have PLIs, you have other schemes. The tariffs actually enable this little transition in giving a kick to domestic production. But mind you, in a lot of our free trade agreements, we are also negotiating on sectors where we have PLIs. But only thing is the tariffs won't come down overnight. There will be a gliding reduction in tariffs over 5 to 7 to 10 years. So I think industry gets adequate protection to actually pick up scale, pick up manufacturing size. And once they are large enough and they are competitive, I think they can take on the world. I mean, I'll give you a simple example. I mean, take two-wheeler industry. I mean, this is a highly protected sector till the 1990s. Mm. Today, they are world beaters. India is always either number one or two in two-wheeler manufacture. Yeah. So I think the same will hold good for a mm. lot of PLI schemes. We will get scale as well as competitiveness. You know, you spoke about PLI schemes, sir. so let me ask you about uh, whether there is a feeling, at least as far as some of these PLI schemes is concerned, that more needs to be put on the table. I'll ask you this in the context of reports suggesting that Metis is putting together a proposal to enhance the incentives for hardware manufacturing, uh, to draw in the likes of Apple, etc., to do more here in the country, uh, because there haven't been as many takers as the government would have liked. Do you believe that uh, given... Uh, the competition from uh, the Vietnams, etc., of the world, and to try and capitalize on the uh, companies that are looking for an alternative to China, more sweeteners will have to be put on the table. Okay, I'll put it this way. I mean, what exactly is the detail of what Mighty is doing, I may not be knowing. But the simple point is, PLI is an excellent program. That's the only way you kickstart large-scale manufacturing. We missed this bus 25 years ago through reservation for SSIs. It's the first time that government has looked at scale seriously, and I think that's a very good thing. If we get onto that track, it'll be good for us. Now, coming to us, competition is concerned. I mean, semiconductors, our competition is actually United States. I mean, they've come up with a $50 billion-plus scheme mm. for actually getting chip manufacturing back home. So it's not only the developing countries, it's the developed world which are in competition in some strategic areas. So I'm sure there will be efforts to get more and more of these sectors back home for manufacturing. But the real big competition is actually our neighborhood. It's Vietnam, it's Indonesia, it's also our near neighbors in South Asia who actually want to attract a lot of investment. And I think the PLIs are doing a good job. And wherever tweaking is necessary, I mean, there's a PLI which is going to be there for our uh, next year, the International Year of Millets. So there'll be PLIs for millets to promote actually healthy eating. So it's all not necessarily in, you know, high fancy sectors. It can be also very mundane sectors. The other is mm. a lot of the stuff which are actually showing electronics, auto, solar, PV. I think these are all areas where once the shift play takes place, we will grow on our own. The PLI will then vanish. It's important to do that initial yeah. shift. I mean, we were, for example, I'll keep talking about APIs. We were a big manufacturer of APIs in the past. But at some point, it was found that this is too much of a problem continuing with APIs. Our chaps shifted down the stream into manufacturing final pharma and APIs went elsewhere without realizing that you can actually get choked out of the pharma market completely. So I think the, the, the scheme mm. is there. It is constantly tweaked to ensure the results we want. I think it's a very focused scheme. It's monitored at the highest level by the cabinet secretary very periodically. All of us actually sit on those committees. So I think it's got off to a good start. Okay. Uh, you know, let's talk about the unfinished agenda, sir. Uh, you were hopeful that the Desh bill, which is the new SEZ legislation, would have gone through. Uh, that hasn't been the case. Also, the, the new trade policy uh, has been uh, postponed as well. On both those counts, uh, what, what's the expectation now in terms of rollout? Okay. The unfinished agenda is very long. I've been around just for a year. And things don't actually get everything done in government in a year. A lot has been done, but a lot has yet to be done. A commitment to a new SEZ bill is actually by the finance minister herself in the budget speech. So this is to be done. We would have liked to get it through uh, in the last session. The, the timeline given in the budget was six months. The winter session is not far away. It's in the last stage of interministerial consultations. And I think that is going to be a big, big boost for our manufacturing in terms of India actually becoming part of global value chains. Once I think uh, it gets through to parliament, and of course parliament will have to pass it, uh, I think it will make a remarkable difference. But the bigger change that is now required is actually recasting and restructuring the commerce department. It's only a job half done. 
what we are actually not having, and that's the big, big uh, agenda on the table, is India not having a trade promotion body. India is one of the few large or even small economies which doesn't have an exclusive trade promotion body. And I think that's one of the areas which my successor will have to work on, that we set up a trade promotion body. You can call it by whatever name you want it to be. It will be present in missions. It will be present mm -hmm. in Delhi in departments. It will be present in states. And it becomes an autonomous, an arm's length kind of a body which is constantly driving the agenda of trade across the world, supporting Indian manufacturers, supporting Indian services, improving our branding across the world. I mean, that's the way the rest of the world actually progressed on trade. So far, this was a more laid-back approach, things happening within the department. A lot of exports were autonomous. You know, numbers in the past which are thrown as targets were actually wishful thinking, and you actually hope that at the end of the year you are somewhere near it. I think that approach cannot sustain. We need to have active trade promotion. So I think that's going to be the biggest delivery of the department in the next, say, 12 months or so. Along with that, there will be other stuff like, you know, the new SCZ bill, the new five plantation boards are there in the department. You'll have five bills on that, which are in the final stages of the cabinet. They should be reaching them soon. So there are many other things which are there. All these put together, I think, will transform the way the department looks. It's moved into a new building. So I think the new building is a sign of the new way in which it will function. It looks very corporate, the open seating, open plan. I think that also will open up people's minds. Okay, so not just a, a new building, but a new style of operations. That's the hope there as far as the, the newly recast uh, uh, work in progress uh, as far as the Commerce Department is concerned. Mr. Subramaniam, uh, you know, I, I, we spoke about the currency volatility. We're seeing what's happening. The reality either, uh, you know, going back to going back to the past uh, crisis and comparing that to this crisis, it's very clear that we find ourselves better positioned and better poised today. But how worried would you be about the current account deficit, uh, given the volatility at this point in time? You see, I'm not worried on the export front. I think we'll manage it. The system is, you know, fully geared, not just to meet targets. But, you know, there is a worry on the import front. Uh, they are rising, imports are rising. Uh, a lot of these things cannot be resolved in the short run. But if you tax imports too much, it will actually feed into your domestic system, both in manufacturing as well as exports, as well as inflation. So that will have to be handled carefully. There are two solutions to it. One solution, of course, is to actually sell more outside the world, outside India to the rest of the world. And I think that's what we are focused on. So if you sell another 50 billion instead of what we are targeting, that will actually ease the situation. In overall terms, I don't think there is any worry. But as far as the, you know, uh, the currency situation is, the reserve situation is, I think the RBI is looking at it carefully. We have had statements from the RBI governor. I think we will sail through. We are far better positioned today than we ever were, either in 2008 or in 2013, to weather the global storm. In fact, India is probably one of the best positioned economies right now, which is not suffering from a lot of things which are happening in the developed world. And it's probably largely because we have run a far tighter fiscal policy in the last two years when COVID uh, forced other countries to have a very loose fiscal policy. Mm. Uh, you know, you talked about some of the interventions that the government put in place uh, uh, to try and check inflation. You also uh, cautioned about be doing too much on the import tax side. Uh, but do you believe that uh, uh, given where we find ourselves that more measures may be required at this point in time? I, I guess this has to be a very calibrated approach. If, if, if we've put some restrictions, we've, we've put some taxes somewhere, but we've also put some restrictions on exports, particularly in food items for our own food security. So it, it is a tight spot. But the simple point is, I mean, it's economics 101. You know, a tax on imports is a tax on exports. So I think it, 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 it's something which I think very basic, which everybody understands. But given the way the world is moving, uh, if we position ourselves well, we strategize well, we take advantage of the currency situation that is developing, our exporters are certainly bullish, I think we'll be able to weather this. It will not be as worrisome as a lot of media is reporting. I think we'll do quite all right. 
Well, Mr. Subramanian, we will leave it there. Appreciate you joining us here on CNBC TV 18. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your time, not just today, but through the course of your tenure. Uh, we appreciate it, and uh, we wish you the very best of luck with your new assignment. Thank you very much. Well, that is the Commerce Secretary, our outgoing Commerce Secretary. He retires tomorrow and will be taking over at the ITPO. But with that, it is time for us to wrap up this edition of the Newsmaker. Thanks very much for watching. Stay tuned. The news continues on the other side.